The following is an extended product spotlight paid for by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hey everyone, I'm Sean Haney, host of Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM, and founder of realagriculture.com. Welcome to the next episode of the Canola Podcast, sponsored by Invigor Hybrid Canola from BSF. The Canola Podcast is a series where we discuss useful tips and tools growers can take to the field to help grow successful crops. Who doesn't want to do that? Don't forget to also check out canolaschool.com to see agronomic videos from Real Agriculture and BSF. The best part of the Canola School videos, they're on demand. You watch them when you need the information. So uh, please check it out at canolaschool.com. Uh, today we're going to talk about canola diseases like clubroot, blackleg, verticillium stripe, and what to look for when scouting. And this is the time of the year where we got to scout, 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 scout. And uh, also talking about what to do if these diseases are present in your field. We want to avoid them being in our field, but if they're there, what do we have to do? So today, I'm joined by Allison Bishop. She's Technical Services Specialist at BSF. Leighton Blaschko, Technical Services Specialist at BSF. And Jeanette Goche, Senior Technical Services Specialist at BSF. Okay, let's kick off uh, this discussion. And let's start with uh, the one in the room that many people have heard about, hasn't necessarily impacted all of the prairies, but uh, something we definitely need to be aware of, it's club root. And it's been around for a number of years, and the areas that it's impacting is really, really growing. Uh, Leighton, let's start with you. Could you share a bit about the disease and what you look for when scouting as you're kind of around one of those areas that has been impacted? Yeah, for sure, Sean. I mean, I guess, like, you're right. It has been around for a number of years. Uh, pri- probably primarily in the north central Alberta was areas where it's the most prevalent, but it has spread throughout Western Canada. We know there's definitely cases in Manitoba. There's definitely incidents where, where it's been found in Saskatchewan. So when it comes down to, you know, we need an integrated approach uh, when we're trying to deal with it. You know, we we look at uh, the weeds, we look at the soil, we look at, you know, seed as an important consideration, crop rotation, any amendments, maybe the field entrances are really important. But today I want to focus in on the scouting, like you said. And scouting is critical for this uh, this particular disease because club root can be devastating. And the earlier we can find it, the better we are off, the better off we'll be in being able to manage it. So if I guess I start with the disease and like how do we scout for it, it's spread through resting spores in the soil, you know, and so where those spread through soil movement, whether that's tillage or some soil water moving across the landscape, but they're extremely small. I think these spores, you can't see them with the naked eye. They're uh, three microns, so extremely small. I think the human eye can see things that are maybe 25 microns, Uh, in size or a human hair is about 40 microns but these are extremely small so we're not looking for the spores we're looking for the symptoms on the crop so you know and what do those symptoms look like and when do they occur we basically want to be looking at the canola crop at about the early to mid flowering stage right through until uh, potting stage or about maybe when you have seed color change It's the easiest to find when you have that seed color change. Okay. And, and, and so if I, if I do identify that I have it, because everybody's seen some of those pictures, like where they, you know, they, they, the plants pulled out and um, see some of the characteristics of the root. Uh, What do you do if you, if you do find it? Yeah. Well, maybe I should back up a little bit and just talk about what exactly would you be looking for? So if you're in a field, you want to know where to look. So primarily, you'd want to look around the field entrances because we know there's a much, much higher likelihood that you'd find it around field entrances. So that's probably the first place you want to scout or you want to look. The other place you'd want to look is, let's say you were in a swather or at about that same timing and you notice something irregular in a, in a field where it's uh, a little bit, pre- some premature ripening, a patch that doesn't look like it was maybe flooded out or it doesn't look like it was something that was, you know, another type of damage. But if it's at an irregular place, maybe mid slope or something like that, where you see this premature ripening or a thinned out patch of the crop, that's where you might want to hone in on as to the where you want to look. 
And then what are you looking for? You're pulling out a lot of those plant roots. And at that stage, you know, at this premature ripening stage, you want to be looking at the root formation. So canola roots normally look like, I don't know, for lack of a better term, more like a carrot, I guess, with maybe some lateral, uh, you know, root hairs coming out of the side of that carrot. But what you would notice with club root is you might see some small um, galls or formations, irregular massive cells that grows on that on those root hairs. From They can be as small as uh, maybe a pea or they can be as large as your thumb or even bigger than that. So that's what you're looking for. That's what you want to see. Uh, or if you are identifying this disease, we don't want to see it. You know, you don't want to find it, but if you have it in your field, you know, that's something that's uh, important that we can now manage it. So you asked the question about when they, a farmer finds it or an agronomist finds this disease, what should you do about it? I guess you want to really limit the spread. So finding it early is important because you can maybe make some choices about what hybrids you would grow uh, the next time around when you're growing canola. But even more importantly, if you have a larger patch with lots of club root galls that are found, then you want to limit its spread. So some people even employ something called patch management mm -hmm. where they grow some grass in that area or maybe and it'll double the size of that area to... Uh, and keep that area out of production so you're not dragging tillage equipment through it, cedars through it, driving uh, sprayers and those kind of things through that area. So managing it that way is an important aspect. You mentioned it's most commonly found at the entrance to the field. Is that because of bringing soil tag in from other fields and, and that's where they're yeah, that's dropped? Yeah, the, uh, that's what we typically find is, you know, sometimes you can see that if there was dirt on the – tires of a piece of equipment those that dirt will fall off right as you enter into the field or else maybe your cedar your air drill uh, as you're putting the wings down to start a field some of those clumps of soil that you might have drugged that you might have picked up in a in a different field they could contain club root and when you're winging down to get to start seeding those clumps fall off near the field entrance so that's why we speculate that we typically would find it in that area Okay, thanks, Leighton. Appreciate the update and uh, thoughts to consider when it comes to club root. Let, let's now move on to black leg. Uh, Allison, could you talk a bit about black leg and what we need to be thinking about when we, we consider uh, its impacts? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Sean. So canola is actually susceptible to black leg throughout its entire life cycle. Um, so it can be seen at all stages, not just at that stem cankering, um, those mature stages that we typically see it at. Um, so as Leighton mentioned, the different ways that black leg was spread or clubbert was spread, black leg moves through wind or rain splash. And it's typically actually seen as a secondary infection. Um, it's key to note that this disease is saprophytic, which means that it enters the plant through dead material. So if you have hail or other diseases first, you're actually quite often uh, leaving the door open for this disease to get in. Okay, I actually didn't know that. That's interesting. Okay, so when we're going to scout for black leg, what exactly am I looking for? Great question. So the best time to look for black leg, uh, as I said, you can see it at any time of the year, but the best time to look for it is at, is at that traditional swath timing. So that's at that 60% seed color change. At that timing, you can pull out plants randomly. You want to ensure that they aren't volunteers that you're pulling out. And you want to do a stem clipping. So right at that base of the stem is where you want to do a clipping. And then you want to look at that cross section to see what's in there. So you're going to look for black discoloration. And it often appears as almost a pie shape. Um, but it is really simple to just misdiagnose with other diseases. As when you do clip a cross section, you can all typically find black within there. So you are looking for that pie shape, but you do want to get it tested for sure when you're diagnosing this disease. Okay, so because we're looking at it a little bit later on in the season, damage done, I, I would assume. What, what do I do if I find it? Yeah, so to prevent black leg in the future or what if you can do if you found it, we always want to approach this with an integrated pest management approach. Uh, so that's going to make sure that you're using a proper seed treatment, a registered fungicide if that's warranted, possibly if you're on a short rotation and using the same hybrid over and over again. Uh, we do want you to use that for your rotation. Um, but growers are really lucky. Fortunately, Invigor actually has really great genetics so that if 
a grower is selecting our newest hybrids, they can already ensure that they have the most robust black leg package. Yeah, I, I, I think when it comes to black leg, sometimes with growers, not top of mind because they sort of – didn't we solve this problem? Right, but it's 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 not true. We need you know we need to be thinking about that that genetics package to ensure that we've got the the the, the right package for our farm when it comes to black leg. And we are still doing the scouting. That's important too, right? Definitely. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this is one's a little bit fresher for some of us. A bit of a hotter topic, I guess. I would put it that way. Verticillium stripe. Uh, now, Allison mentioned some of the misdiagnoses. I've heard here that this is where black leg and verticillium kind of uh, can can be cross misidentified, I guess. But uh, Jeanette, can you offer some insights? What is verticillium uh, stripe, and uh, how's it impacting us? Yeah, so a new to us disease in canola in Western Canada, or Canada, I guess Canada wide, but not new uh, globally. Europe's had it. Um, Brassica vegetable production in the States, they deal with it as well. So definitely new to us though. I would say it was 2015 when it was first identified in Manitoba. And, uh, you know, the CFIA did follow up surveys with the provinces and found that, you know, you can find it across Canada. It's just a little bit more prevalent in Manitoba at this point, but we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we just focused on Manitoba. So we've definitely seen that um, since it was first found in in Manitoba, just south of Winnipeg there, we've definitely developed some hot spots in Manitoba. Uh, you can find it in almost every canola field there now, but um, definitely the folks that border Manitoba along the Saskatchewan uh, border, eastern Saskatchewan, starting to see it a bit more and in North Dakota as well. So it is definitely out there. Uh, Allison, you raise a good point. Uh, verticillium is definitely a good one to know what it looks like so you can ID it properly so that you're not misdiagnosing your fields because um, definitely different, different management tactics for the different diseases. Yeah, so uh, yield robber, what does verticillium do to, the, to, our, to our crop? That is the downside to verticillium. I feel like because it's so new, we don't have a lot of great specific information. I'll say though that um, peer reviewed literature from, from Europe says, yeah, there's hit and miss yield effect. We seem to be seeing that same thing here. Sometimes we seem to see it, sometimes we don't. It's a little bit hard to say too, because it often occurs with other diseases like black leg. So I think there's some fantastic projects going on uh, through the Canola Council and, and some of the universities across the West here to answer some of those questions. In the meantime, though, I would say there's probably not much we can do to address the, the yield perspective, but I would say the biggest pain point for farmers that have um, higher levels of verticillium is that in some years it causes lodging and I don't even know if lodging is the right word. It just totally obliterates stock strength. So you end up with this crop that's right on the ground. It's really tough to harvest. Sometimes you have to harvest in one direction. Um, you know, if you have a flex draper, it helps, but you're still going really slowly to pick up this canola. So um, that's something that we want to look at. You know, it's good to know if we do have verticillium, if you can see it in your field, if spots are starting to go down, you can probably prioritize those fields to harvest first. Um, and if it's across the board, then you might start thinking about different ways to maybe manage it, looking at your plant stand counts, going back to your early agronomy, uh, when you're seeding even, just to try to address some of those things to keep your canola on its feet. Okay, so identifying it. We're, we got a bit of a theme here. We got to get out and scout. So when we are scouting for it, when are we doing that? And what are we looking for? Yeah, so this one's been a good learning curve for myself and other agronomists. Um, happy to share what we know. I think when you look, uh, again, lots of times when there's reports on verticillium stripe, uh, some of the, the things that they say that you might see, like yellowing early on uh, in the crop or stunting, 
are things that we haven't really seen here in the field in the West. So I, I would knock those out. If you're used to scouting for verticillium, you can probably pick up on some cues as early as flowering, but I would say that's probably not the best time. Um, that typical scouting, uh, Allison mentioned that 60% seed color change. Leighton also uh, said that was a good time to look for club root. So there's definitely things that you can see in fields, especially when we do have uh, higher spore loads. And some of those things are, uh, well, it's called verticillium stripe for a reason. And there is that characteristic stem striping. So um, you'll have a green canola stem and half of it starts turning brown. This can look a lot like fusarium wilt, um, but really fusarium wilt resistance is pretty much table stakes in canola across the West or here in Canada. And so our Invigor hybrids have it. So really, I would say seeing fusarium wilt at this point would be extremely rare. And if you're not getting those wilt symptoms, you can pretty much say that that's verticillium. Um, like Allison said though, good idea to get it tested. So some of the other things you can do at that timing, you'll pull out a plant that does have some of that striping. You can again, uh, cut it across the stem like you would for black leg assessment. And you will get this kind of gray starburst or just gray across the stem. It's not that same black wedge um, that you get with black leg. But if you do have high enough uh, infection levels with verticillium, sometimes it makes it really hard to pick apart what is black leg and what's verticillium. So again, sending it away for testing is a good idea. But I actually think that if you wait until harvest, that's probably your best time to verify verticillium. So seeing some of these symptoms in the field at that 60% seed color change might just be a flag that you should go back and collect stocks for, for submission. Um, I also think that sometimes when we do go out at 60% seed color change, so that traditional survey time, that if we don't have high infection loads, we might be missing verticillium. So it is one of those diseases where um, if you do have low levels, those symptoms are really, they're increasing as the crop dries down. So again, if this is newer to your area, something that you probably want to go out at harvest, uh, right around harvest, just before, just after, and then you're looking for, um, your stems have probably grayed up. You might not be seeing that brown stripe, but the epidermis will be peeling back. You'll see these peppery spots along the stem. Um, you might see some of these stems that are falling apart. Again, if you pull out the stems and, and do your cross section cut, you might be seeing some of that discoloration. So if you feel like you have it, I won't list off labs. I think there's a lot of labs that are offering it though. Uh, you can definitely send away these stocks at this timing and they'll be able to verify for you. Okay, so what do I do if if they do find something? Yeah, that's the worst thing about verticillium. There's really nothing you can do um, at this point. There's no seed treatment. There's no fungicide. Um, there, there's no genetics at this point either. I mean, that's something that's that's being looked at. And I think currently... Um, for example, the Invigor breeding crew is assessing our hybrids currently for tolerance, and I say tolerance. Um, some of the university projects as well are looking at uh, just natural tolerances within canola hybrids. Um, I would sticking to some of the early findings suggest that maybe sticking to some of the 300 series genetics or newer genetics do seem to be standing up better. And uh, yeah, really, if you do find it at harvest, there's probably not much you're doing um, to manage it. And so you're just prepping yourself for next year. It's it's one of those diseases, I think once you have it, you have it. So that means next year you are looking at increasing your crop rotations, right? Throwing something else in there. Um, also looking at, again, the, just those all those things to do right to set up canola, making sure that you're hitting those five to seven plants, you know, keeping it 
relatively disease-free, stress-free if you can. Um, just setting it up so that it's a relatively healthy stand going into harvest, that seems to help quite a bit. Okay, great. So rapid fire time. Are, are there any other scouting tips and tricks that uh, the three of you like to share? You, you walk a lot of fields. You talk to a lot of customers. You've, you've also got the, the trial program that you run. I'm sure you've got some tips you'd love to share. Do you want to start, Layton? Yeah, sure. I think for me, I think when I think about club root and scouting for club root, there's probably sort of three things that I would say. First of all, when you're looking and you're scouting for club root, you want to pull out a lot of plants. I went out with the, one of the University of Alberta researchers a couple few years back, and we were pulling, we go into the field, and you, you are looking. Normally, when you scout, you might pull out half a dozen plants or 10 or 20 or something like that in an area. But here you want to pull out a hundred or more. I mean, literally a hundred or more plants because you want early detection. You want to find it. Um, if you just pull out five, you may not find the needle in the haystack. So that's one thing that I would say. Another thing is as the disease progresses and you're pulling out some of those plant roots, you may say, oh, there's not that great big gall on there. I don't see this big mass of tissue. It looks like a bunch of rotten uh, sawdust, it kind of looks like. Well, that might mean that the gall is already broken down and started to rot. So, you know, be careful and look, you know, don't uh, look past that and say, well, I don't see this great big, you know, hard gall on the, on the root. So that would be the second thing. And then maybe the third thing would be, you know, look for volunteers and make sure volunteer canola management is really part of your program, your, your agronomy for your farm, because that's where you can often find club root is in volunteers and not necessarily in the row where, you know, where you know you seeded and you have to see those maybe blue uh, seed coats and those sorts of things. So those are sort of three things that I think I, should, I like to focus on. Okay, good. Uh, Allison, your turn. Yeah, I think something common that we've all mentioned is premature ripening. So when growers are driving past their field um, at that maturity timing and they see maybe a patch that has uh, premature ripening in it, it's always great to pull over and start pulling plants out in that area. That's going to be your first sign to lots of these diseases out there, um, or lots of the canola diseases, I should say specifically, but uh, go out there. You may just have a patch that was seeded heavily, um, so we're seeing some premature ripening there, but quite often those are the beginning to some disease patches. So I would start with that, and then I think that's something that's extremely cool about black leg is when you're differentiating it from other diseases, if you pull it out, um, if you feel the outside of the stem, if you have severe cases, it those pycnidia spores on the outside will feel like gray. So that's a, a, a really neat differentiating factor with black leg. And Jeanette, you can wrap it up. Yeah, I would say I definitely agree with Allison and Layton. Uh, so definitely do that and then consider a comprehensive test. You know, if you're not sure what you're looking at, these things often occur together, especially if you are in an area where maybe rotations are or have been tighter. Um, definitely seeing it in the field where you see, you know, a patch and you're like, huh, I'm wondering what that is. And I just remember two fields not far apart. One field had verticillium and club root, and the other one was verticillium and black leg. So um, making sure that when you are looking, you aren't just pulling those few plants like Leighton said and writing it off as, oh, verticillium, because, you know, now we all have this in Manitoba. Um, or if you're in other areas, you know, maybe it's club root. You know, definitely pulling those plants together, getting a second opinion, or submitting them to those labs for verification, because you could have multiple things going on. Great stuff. Well, I really appreciate this. Uh, this is uh, this is really been great. These are three important diseases that we need to make sure we're doing what we can to identify, and if there are tools in the toolbox to fend against. I'd like to thank Allison, Leighton, and Jeanette for joining us here today for this dis discussion on canola diseases, scouting for these diseases, and their recommendations for what to do if you find any of them in your fields. Uh, plus, don't forget to visit canolaschool.com to check out videos from Real Agriculture and BSF for, for all you need to know about growing canola. Thanks for listening to the Canola Podcast, and enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, good luck with the rest of the growing season. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.